Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. If you polled a bunch of NFL fans in 1970 and asked them who the greatest running back in the NFL was at the time, the name that probably comes up the most often is this man right here. This is Cardinals running back MacArthur Lane, and he was well on his way to becoming a star. He looked like he was going to be the future of the Cardinals franchise. He had a season to remember, and a season where he was almost untouchable and unstoppable. He had a season where he might have been the best running back in all of professional football. And then, the following year, it all came crashing down. One year after being the face of the Cards franchise, he had a tumultuous and disastrous exit from the team. Underwhelming numbers, combined with a bitter feud with the front office and a suspension that all but sealed his fate with the team, led MacArthur Lane to being off the Cardinals just one year after being the key part of their offense. That raises the question, what happened to MacArthur Lane? This is the story of his chaotic 1971 season, and how everything fell apart. Before I talk about the 1971 season and his bitter exit from the Cardinals, we need some context to understand just who MacArthur Lane is in the first place, because it will help us to understand his importance within the organization and why this exit was so brutal to begin with. Entering the 1968 NFL Draft, the Cardinals had a problem on their hands. In 1967, their starting fullback was Prentice Scott, and during that 1967 campaign, he actually had one of the best years of his career, running for a career-high 573 yards and picking up a career-high 775 yards from scrimmage. The one-two punch of Johnny Rowland and Prentice Scott wasn't necessarily blowing people away, and it was far from the best in the league, but they ranked in the top half of the league in every major rushing category. However, after the 1967 season, Scott retired. With that, the Cardinals needed a new fullback, and they decided to draft Utah State man MacArthur Lane in the first round of the 1968 NFL Draft. The pick made sense, especially since the top two guys that the Cards had on their board, UTEP linebacker Fred Carr and Missouri offensive tackle Russ Washington, went before the Cards got a chance to pick. Even though Lane would be a 26-year-old rookie, the coaching staff was really high on him. He was coming off of an incredible senior season where he averaged 6.4 yards per carry, and an even better junior year where he averaged 7.6 yards per carry. Lane didn't play a whole lot in 1968 and 1969, receiving minimal reps while guys like Sid Edwards and Willis Crenshaw took the carries. But in 1970, Lane would finally get his opportunity with the St. Louis Cardinals to show what he was made of. And the end result of this? Well, let's just say that you can make a legitimate argument for Lane being the best back in all of football. He finished the season with 977 rushing yards, which ranked third in the NFL, only behind Larry Brown of Washington and Ron Johnson of the New York Giants. He averaged 4.7 yards per carry. Among running backs to have at least 200 carries in 1970, Lane ranked second in football. Despite touching the ball 238 times, he only fumbled twice. This was at a time where it was common for backs with 150 or more touches to fumble at least five or six times in a season. He had a game against the Philadelphia Eagles where he scored five touchdowns. He had a four-game stretch at one point in the season with 464 rushing yards, over six yards per carry, and seven touchdowns. And after a 31-0 victory over the Boston Patriots in Week 8 where he scored three rushing touchdowns, he was legitimately on pace to tie the all-time record for touchdowns in a single season, held by Jim Brown in 1965. While Lane didn't get the record, he did finish the season with 11 rushing touchdowns and 13 total touchdowns, both of which ranked first in the league. He became the first player in Cardinals history to finish the season as the league leader in rushing touchdowns. In 1970, he was on top of the world. In 1971, it all fell apart. Coming off of a 1970 season where he made the Pro Bowl and helped guide the Cardinals to an 8-5-1 record, Lane was looking to get paid. He wanted to be paid like one of the top backs in football, and there was no way he was taking a discount, especially since he was already 29 years old, and especially since his contract in 1970 was based off of his lack of production over his first two seasons. On top of that, he was already somewhat disgruntled with the coaching staff for not hitting the 1,000-yard mark and for how that season ended. The Cards lost their final three games of the season to miss out on the playoffs. In one of those games against the Detroit Lions, a 16-3 loss, he only carried the ball 10 times. In another one of those games against the New York Giants, a 34-17 loss, he only carried the ball 9 times. While head coach Charlie Winner was no longer there, as Bob Holland was now the man in charge, Lane was still feeling annoyed at how everything ended in 1970, and he just wanted to get paid. As a side note, if you want to learn more about head coach Charlie Winner, then click the card in the upper right corner. During the offseason, talks between Lane and Bidwell were going nowhere. Lane wanted a pay increase before the season started, and the owner wasn't giving it to him. 
And to make matters worse, as the season drew closer, it would be physically impossible for Lane to get his money. To make a long story short, in 1971, the United States was facing a serious problem regarding inflation, and President Richard Nixon wanted to stabilize the dollar. Because of this, he implemented a wage freeze and a price freeze, which was the first one of the United States since World War II. What this meant was that for the next 90 days, no one could renegotiate their contract for more money. And this meant that Lane was now stuck playing the 1971 season on his 1970 contract terms. Naturally, this ticked off Lane, who was now furious at the Cardinals organization for their treatment of him. And making matters worse was the fact that in 1971, the Cardinals were really bad. Under head coach Bob Hallway, they were not a good team at all. Through the first 12 weeks of the season, they were just 4-7-1. The Green Bay Packers were the only team in the NFC with fewer wins than the Cards at the time. They had one heartbreaking loss to the San Diego Chargers on Monday Night Football, which truly exemplified Hallway's terrible coaching style. You can learn more about that disaster on the finish by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And Lane was frustrated with his production. Whereas he had 180 carries in 1970 through the first 12 weeks, he only had 142 through the same point in 1971, including multiple games where he touched the ball four times or less on the ground. And in the penultimate game of the season, his frustrations were about to reach a boiling point. December 12, 1971. We're at Veterans Stadium for this NFC East matchup between the Philadelphia Eagles and the St. Louis Cardinals. On its own, this game has absolutely no bearing on the season whatsoever. Both the Eagles and Cardinals sit at 4-7-1. And, and with both teams' four wins back in the playoff spot with two to play, both these teams, unsurprisingly, have been mathematically eliminated from postseason contention. The objective with this game was to just get close to finishing out what has been a disastrous season without any added drama or headaches going into the offseason. As you can probably expect, that didn't happen. The Eagles won this game 19-7. The Cardinals struggled to get anything going offensively, which goes without saying when you only put up 7 points. They turned the ball over 5 times. Starting quarterback Jim Hart went 4 for 11 with 65 yards passing, no touchdowns, 2 interceptions, and a passer rating of 17.4, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. Pete Beathard came in to relieve him, and he didn't do much better, going 4 for 14 with 2 picks. And it was a rough day for MacArthur Lane, who finished the game with just 19 rushing yards on 8 carries. Philly held him in check, and handed St. Louis its fourth defeat in their last six games. And afterwards, Lane was furious. He was fed up with everything. He was fed up with playing the season on a ridiculously bad contract. He was fed up with not being utilized. He was fed up with the front office. And he was fed up with being held in check in another losing effort. With that, Lane went on a full-blown rant in the post-game press conference. When asked about his production, Lane said, Everybody wants to know why I don't carry the ball more. It's a good question. I wish I knew the answer. But he didn't just leave it at that. Because in the locker room, he saw Bidwell talking with reporters with Bidwell saying, I think the morale has been pretty good. And that prompted Lane to lose his mind even more. Lane heard those comments and said, Morale? Well, if there's a depth you can reach, I think we're at the bottom. And he followed that up with the infamous comment that practically ended his career as a Cardinal. He saw Bidwell, pointed to him in the middle of the room, and said, That fat bleep bleeper is the guy responsible. He's the cause of all this trouble. All the money's right there in his stomach. You can understand Lane's frustration with everything, but this was the moment where he completely snapped. As it turns out, that would be one of his last moments as a St. Louis Cardinal. Bidwell obviously heard these remarks, because how could he not? And he decided to suspend Lane for the final game of the season, which was the season finale on the road against the defending NFC champion Dallas Cowboys. Lane apologized for the comments and said afterwards, I just spoke without thinking. I put my foot in my mouth. What I said was in a rage of anger. The whole season has been so frustrating. Without Lane, the Cards would lose that season finale 31-12, and would finish the game with just 88 yards rushing on 3.3 yards per carry, finishing the season with a 4-9-1 record, which was tied for their worst record since moving to St. Louis in 1960. What's odd about all of this, however, was that it seemed for a brief moment like all of this was going to be water under the bridge. One month later, in January 1972, Lane and the team were talking about a reworked contract. Lane later said that he was very close to signing the new contract, saying we had settled our disagreements when I was there, and the Cardinals and I were both happy. I'm not sure how many people expected a happy ending from this, but for the briefest period of time, it sure seemed like it was heading that way against all odds. However, there's a reason that I said it seemed like that for a brief moment in time. Because a few weeks later, Lane was traded in a straight swap with the Green Bay Packers in exchange for running back Donnie Anderson. Lane was stunned by this, and Cardinals coach Bob Hallway wanted to make things very clear that the comments made by Lane about Bidwell a few months before 
had nothing whatsoever to do with the trade, saying we resolved any problems we had with Lane. The suspension didn't prompt the trade. But either way, Lane was no longer a Cardinal. The 1971 season, with all the chaos and turmoil that came from it, was his last in St. Louis. That raises one final question. How did Lane finish his career now that his tumultuous tenure in St. Louis was behind him? During the 1972 season, now that he was on the Packers, he played an instrumental part in guiding Green Bay to the postseason, starting every game for the team while posting over 1,100 yards from scrimmage. The one-two punch of John Brockington and MacArthur Lane was tough for defenses to handle, as the Packers had one of the top rushing attacks in the National Football League with those two at the helm. While Lane's play dipped in the two seasons after that, with his yards per carry average dipping to a career-worst 3.1 in 1973 and another career-worst 2.6 in 1974, in 1975, he found himself on the Kansas City Chiefs, and had a career revival of sorts. Perhaps one of the more shocking seasons in NFL history from a production standpoint came in 1976, when Lane led the NFL with 66 receptions. Keep in mind, this was a 34-year-old fullback who had never finished in the top 10 of receptions in a single season, and whose career high in this category was 34. And here he was in 1976, nearly doubling that career high and leading the league becoming the first player in Chiefs history to ever accomplish this feat. Lane would go on to play until 1978, retiring at the age of 36. To play 11 seasons in the NFL, especially since he didn't even enter the league until he was 26, and to be at one point the best back in football is a heck of a career. Still, you have to wonder what could have been if Bidwell wasn't so cheap, and just how good Lane's career could have been. MacArthur Lane was on pace to be the face of that franchise, and even though Hallway said that the trade had nothing to do with the dispute, you don't make a one-for-one -one swap with an objectively worse player and give up your first-round pick that led the league in touchdowns one year ago without some underlying factor. Lane had a chance, if the circumstances were right, to be remembered among some of the greatest backs in franchise history, like John David Crow, Johnny Rowland, and Ali Matson. Instead, for many Cards fans, their lasting legacy of Lane is the final memory that he left with the team, which was him telling off Bill Bidwell after reaching his breaking point in an utterly frustrating and disappointing 1971 season. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes, link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gear 9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping with the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.